Today on Chris Performance Repair, we're going to go over the cam bearing portion of if you were to do a DOD or AFM delete kit or any kind of service to the camshaft on an LS based engine and the camshaft bearings were worn out. So I have a specialty tool that I will give you the information in just a bit for, but we're going to go ahead and show you how to use it and how to remove and install new bearings with the crank installed in the engine. And we're going to get the new bearings installed in this thing. So the first thing you need to do is determine whether you need new bearings or not. Now, the factory GM bearings, they are just horrible junk. I mean, they are just the most terrible design, which I will show you in a little bit as to why they're so bad. This was a remanufactured motor, but it still has the OEM style bearings in it, so they are still a very crude bearing. But when I pulled the camshaft out of this thing, I knew the bearings were not going to be good right away when I pulled it out, because the first thing I did when I started pulling on that cam, I noticed it came a little bit and then stopped. I pushed it in, it would have moved this way easy, and it would spin easy. But when I actually had to get it out of there, I actually had to put a little bit of force into it because it had worn grooves into the bearings. So these have on the second bearing, so the cam bearing directly above, which, you know, because the motor's upside down, so above this main, that cam bearing has a groove on the cam portion of it. That's for oil control for the VVT system. Now, whether you do or don't have VVT, you will likely still have that groove in there. That groove is what worn down on this second bearing area where it caused a spot that made it hard to pull out. So we'll see how bad it is once we get the bearings out of there. But we're going to show you how to use that tool down there to remove these bearings. I'm going to go ahead and pull a bearing out quickly just to show you what the bearing looks like this is going to be the front bearing, so I'm going to show you what damage to look for to determine whether your bearings are pretty worn out or not if you don't have the scenario when you're pulling that camshaft out that it gets stuck. This one was obviously worn out enough that it caused that issue, so I know the bearings are going to look pretty rough. So this tool is a cam bearing installer remover tool. It is specifically designed for camshaft bearings. It has different collets, the ends here, that can fit different size bearings for different engines. Now I'll go ahead and throw a link in the description below for this tool. It's a very nice tool to have if you're doing enough engine work to need it. Otherwise you might want to try and find a place to rent one. I don't have a recommendation for where you could do that. But you might be able to find something maybe at an O'Reilly's or something. I'm not sure. But basically what you need to do is you need to find the collar that is the right size to loosely fit in the bearing but not too loose. When you line this collar up to slide it on the collar in here, you need to make sure that the the slots line up with the slots on here. If you don't, it will break this inner collar. So line that up as best you can. And then you're gonna have to slide it into the bearing and the bolt that is on the end of there, you're gonna have to grab it with a wrench. Now, if you get the crank in the right position, you should be able to grab a hold of that thing with a wrench, I got a hold of it now, and then you can turn this to tighten that collar up. Now, once it starts to tighten up, you want to be able to kind of wiggle this thing around and feel for when it's flush against the bearing before you actually give it a nice snug and make sure that it's tight enough. Because the flatter it is against that bearing, the better it's going to take it out. So now you can see I am against this portion here and I have my wrench on there. I got to pull the wrench out. I'm going to set it on the floor because when I start swinging at this, the motor is going to shift. Now, right now, I have the engine stand against that part of my hoist for a reason because when you hit this, it does try and shift the motor back. Usually I'll put my foot over in front of a wheel to do it and then I'll start swinging at it. You're going to want to use a pretty good sized hammer for this. And it'll come out relatively easily. So once that happens, now the problem is the crankshaft is still in here so you can't reach in there very easily. You're going to have to kind of try and finagle this thing to get it so that you can access it with the wrench. So I'm going to tip it up, line that wrench up with it, and usually it comes loose e yeah, easier than what you tightened it. Once you loosen it up, you can take and pull this guy out. It'll leave the bearing in there, but now the bearing is loose. 
So you can push the bearing in, grab yourself a magnet. Now, if you don't have one of these flexible magnets, I'll go ahead and link one in the description. They're very nice to have, and they don't break as often as the extendable ones. Get a hold of the bearing, and then you just have to play the fishing game to try and fish it out of there. So now I need to determine what it is that made this bearing bad, or all the bearings bad. So if you look at this bearing here, you'll notice this connection right here. Now, this is the main flaw in the GM bearings, is this type of design that they use. What this is, is it's a flat piece of steel with a joint made. They roll it around a piece of metal and they clink it together and then try and make it a cylinder, but the truth is it does not make a circle. You can see the bearing is not even contacting this side with the cam at all. It's actually a very rough finish yet. And then when you get over here, it's contacting it. And when you get over here, it's actually worn all the way through the Babbitt material that is supposed to protect the bear. So it is wearing very badly. This is actually the bottom. That's the oil hole. And we'll explain the oil holes and line them up in a moment when we go to replace it. But first, before we do that, we also have to talk about bearing numbering. You can see this has a number one on it. So that number one is significant because that means it's the first bearing in the line of where the bearing position goes. Now, another thing to take note of is when you install and remove bearings, usually that tool will leave marks. It did not leave any marks on this one, which means I had it lined up absolutely perfect. But when it does leave marks, you might be a little bit crooked on there. So when you're hitting it, you're hitting one edge more than the other edge. If you get it squared perfectly, it'll leave less marks, but sometimes it still leaves marks. So now, when I go to remove the rest of these bearings, I have to do it in consecutive order. So I have to do the second one next, this one, this one, and finally this one. So I'm going to go ahead, knock the rest of these out of here, and then we'll start talking about installing. One thing to be note, you have to have the engine out to do the last bearing. There's no question about it, because the last bearing in the back, the rear main cover, has to come off in order to do that last bearing. Okay, we have some bearings here. Uh, this is the one that I just showed you guys. This is that second one I was talking about. We're gonna go ahead and take a quick peek here. Okay, so this one has a little smidge of damage right there for me hitting it. The rest of them all look good though. So as far as wear goes, uh, the all the ones that, except for with the exception of that one, they all look identical to that one there. And yeah, they're, they're pretty much identical, except for this last one. This last one is in the best shape. It has the least wear to it, and it'd probably be okay. But of course, we're going to replace it anyway. Why wouldn't we? So let's talk a little bit about the second one. Okay, so here is that second one. We can see the number. Where's the number on this thing? There we go. You see it has a number two on it. So that number two obviously indicates it's the second one. And then when you look at the bearing surface here, you can see the way it's worn. So you got that big groove that doesn't get touched in the middle there. But if you look where it's worn the most, so where all that copper is visible, I can feel a very... Oh wait, right there I can't feel much. There we go, right here I can feel a very aggressive line into it. In fact, I might be able to let you guys hear me scratching at it. See if I can put it next to the mic. So what I'm doing when I'm doing that mic thing is I'm going across it like this. And that's the scratching that you hear. This is nice and hard here, but this is so soft I can scratch the surface of it off of there just with my thumbnail. So this will be the same. Clean it off with my thumbnail. Obviously they're supposed to be like that so they can take some cushion. And that's why you end up a lot of times with a little bit of metal dust in your oil. It's from things like this wearing off. Now, this is also the main reason for these systems failing with high miles on the engine. So when you have an AFM or DOD, however you want to call it, system on your vehicle, the oil pressure will start to drop slightly. And the oil pressure slightly dropping over years of use is caused from the bearings doing this. They're getting excessive clearance. Now the cam bearings are by far the worst bearings in this particular motor design as far as which ones wear out faster. The rod and crank bearings do wear out but not nearly like this thing does. So these cam bearings are one of the main sources of oil pressure loss. Now these systems are very, very fussy when it comes to oil pressure. The oil pressure is critical to be above 27 PSI whenever the system deactivates those lifters. Otherwise it won't deactivate them fast enough for the valve train events when they're happening and it'll cause damage inside the lifter if it's ever activated below that pressure. So if you see your oil pressure dropping at any 
point in the time that you're dropping it, be sure to address wherever the oil pressure loss is. This is only one source. A lot of things fail as well, like the oil sump o-rings on these motors and the lifters themselves can actually bleed by and I had a video clip on that as well but this is one of the sources of the issue. The, the main source is probably the screen, the second most common oil pump o-ring, the third most common is going to be these bearings and the last is the lifters themselves. But be sure to address that if that's an issue and uh, preferably just turn the system off and not worry about it. But if you need cam bearings, this is how you do it. Let's go ahead and get to installing them. I have the camshaft. I have the bearings. Now I have two different types of bearings here. Technically three because this is the OEM bearing, cam bearing. And I want to cover just a quick thing on bearings. So this is the one that I ordered, the set that I ordered. I was willing to try it. Now this is a coated bearing. Usually coated bearings are for race use, I guess. Uh, it, obviously that's just because they're stronger they can hold up to more pressure so if you have a radical cam in there you're fine but it's just it is a better quality cam bearing overall this one is also a race bearing so this guy here is the one that i usually put in performance cars i thought i would try this one because i like the fact of having a coated bearing even in a factory vehicle and it was actually reasonably affordable now, I got this one from rockauto.com. This is not a sponsored ad. That's just where I go for a lot of my parts because they're very, very cheap. So this part number here, the CC433P, we will see how it installs today. But this guy here, you have to find on a specialty performance shop, CHP25T. Uh, this bearing set is a lot more expensive, but I'm going to show you why it's more expensive and where I think this one might cause problems. So on a variable valve timing engine, this bearing set I don't think is going to work very well. So if you have VVT, I would probably avoid this one simply because those camshafts have uh, a slot in the middle of them and these are not very wide. So you look at the original bearing here, you see a huge difference in width. This side here is more like the correct width. Also. The oiling hole. You can see this oiling hole is very small in here. Now that small oiling hole on a normal engine is not going to be a problem. VVT engines, that might be too much of a restriction for that variable valve uh, actuator scenario because the oil actually goes into the cam, flows through the cam, gets to the solenoid or the actuator. The solenoid of course activates the actuator, so on and so forth. So I do not recommend using this style bearing on those systems. Now this one does not have VVT, but considering the circumstances, I am going to put these bearings in where I can. Now, the only reason I'm going to do that is because I happen to have a couple of these sets around. I did an LS7 that had a custom block, and all the bearing bores were bored out to the same exact size of the larger bearing, so I had to order two sets, so I have extra of the smaller bearings, and I believe that the smaller ones are the size for the VVT section, or second uh, camshaft bearing here. So I'm going to use it, one of those here if I can, and then I'll just use this for the rest of them. But these bearings now, why did I say these things are junk? I mean, for the obvious reason of this, I explained that to you, that, that joint and the fact that they're rolled and they're inconsistent. Why are these so much better? So if you look at these bearings, there is no joint whatsoever in these bearings. They're a solid piece and then they have a nice coating inside there. Now there is a drawback to this bearing specifically. Uh, I'll see if this one has the same thing. I think it does. Yeah, it does. And the drawback comes into this edge here. So I don't know how well I'm able to pick it up, but there's a chamfer on this side and a chamfer on this side, which makes kind of like a knife edge on the edge here. So when I go and put this thing on here, that knife edge is gonna get beat up by my tool. So it is going to leave a burr. Now the question is whether that burr is sitting far enough to actually affect anything. And I'll show you how to check for that as you're installing the bearings, which is what you're going to want to do. You check for it as you're installing it. That way you know ahead of time. I used to just install the bearings and then check the cam, but by doing so you don't know where the binding is happening. If you do it as you're installing them, you'll find out where the binding is happening. So we'll cover that too, but these bearings being a much wider bearing, they're gonna have much more surface area and these have more flow. So if you're keeping VVT in your vehicle, get yourself a set of these or stock replacement that's not a 
AC Delco bearing because these things are garbage. And uh, make sure that they're a solid construction bearing. You'll be good to go if you do that. Let's go ahead and get to installing the bearings here. Uh, obviously, I have them all out. I also cleaned out the bores just with some brake clean and a rag. I didn't really spend much time on it. Just cleaned them out a little bit, not much. So how do you install these bearings and what is the correct order in which to put them? Now, when you look at the box, wherever the label is, typically, this isn't always, typically that goes towards the front of the motor so that when you open it up, they end up lining up perfectly. So we're gonna look at the, this one does not have a bearing number label on it. Normally they'll have on the inside tab here uh, where they say this bearing number fits this section of the block. Uh, this one here, let's see, we have, oh, this is not cool. So there's another thing I don't like about these. They do not have a very logical number on here. <laughs> yeah, that's dumb. Okay, from experience, the numbers that are on here, there is a 12, 2, and then there's the last two digits. Now, this one has 12, 2, 0, 3, 12, 2, 1, 4, 12, 2, 0, 2, 12, 2, 1, 4, 12, 2, 0, 3. Now, if you're paying attention to that, you caught that. These two are the same. These two are the same. And then this one is the individual one. Now that is actually in the correct order for this block. I technically could flip this this way or that way. And that tells me that it is in the correct order right now. So I'm going to go ahead and lay this thing on the floor in the same orientation boxes. If I had a table, I'd just set it right here on the table. But I'm not. My table's full, put it that way. So I'm going to go ahead and set this down over here where I won't kick it. And then we'll start the installation process. So... I'm going to replace the one where this needs to go in the box and take this guy and set it aside because I don't want to use it. And then we're going to start from the back of the motor. So all the way over here and install that one first. When putting these guys in, it is absolutely critical you line these oil holes up with the oil passage inside the block. So these things have an oil passage here. And if you don't line the oil hole up with the oil passage right there, you're going to have a problem. Now, when you do it, and you're looking at it inside the block there, and you put your tool, so the tool would be inside here, right, holding onto it, you can take and leave it just on the very edge there, turn it this way, take a look where the oil hole is, turn it this way, take a look where the oil hole is, and then you can kind of guess to where the center is. Or, if you want to make it easier on yourself, mark the top of the bearing. So if you mark right where the bearing is, you can just use a marker or whatever, it doesn't matter. Just put a little mark on there, and then you'll know where the top is. That has to face up or down, technically, because the engine's upside down. And when you install it, you'll know exactly where that has to line up, and you'll be able to get it perfect every time. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and go to the center in between these two holes. Leave a nice little visible mark here, so I know that it has to be up. It can be plenty wide. It's not going to hurt if it's extra wide. And uh, now, once we get the thing set down in the block, and we're going to use a magnet for that because it should yep, stick to it perfectly fine, we'll take this magnet and we'll drop it down in the block. Once it's in the block, I'm going to use the magnet to rotate this and then take this guy, line it up to it, and then push it all the way through and then use my wrench to tighten it down. Now, we don't have to worry about its position as we're doing all this. Not until we go to he go ahead to actually slide it in there and start hitting on the end of the tool. So I'm going to get started doing that. Now in order to give you guys an idea of what I'm actually looking at here, you can see the mark on the cam there. So I'm going to make sure that is perfectly up and down, and then I will be pushing this in without rotating it and hitting it with the hammer. So when it comes to this kind of cam install tool, there's also this cone. Feel free to put that on there, and then all you have to do is push against that cone, and it'll automatically center this thing for when you hit it. I, I'm still indifferent as to whether I like using that or not. Sometimes I like it, sometimes I don't. When it's on the very farthest bearing, I definitely don't care to use it. I feel like I can line it up a little bit better doing it by hand and feel than uh, using that cone. Now, once you start setting it in there, so I got it in a little ways, 
You don't want to just go gung-ho until it bottoms out because you'll actually push it in too far. You got to be able to check what you're doing and where you're sitting with it. So make sure that you rotate the crank to a position where you can actually see how far in the bearing is and that way you can watch how far you're installing it. Now the one thing you can screw up with the bearing is not having it centered. That's very easy to screw up and if you do that oil hole will still be blocked. So you want to be able to be sure you can check that pretty good. So now that we have that bearing installed uh, we need to be able to check that we didn't damage the bearing too bad. That way we can address any damage that we caused right away before we install the rest of the bearings. In order to do that, you're going to want your camshaft and to actually slide it into place. So this already has a film of oil on it, so I'm not too worried about it right now. Uh, if for some reason you're actually installing it or you're checking the very last one here, then I would lube it with some more grease to be a little safer. But going all the way to the end, I won't be very crooked going into that very last part. So take your time, go nice and slow, and just feel for interference and try not to clash against anything too hard. Of course, don't be afraid to stick a bolt on the end of it. In order to give yourself that extra leverage you need to be able to get it all the way to the back. Now once you get it in there, if the cam slides, slides in nice and easy and you have no problems, there's no resistance when you turn it, you're good to go. This one feels perfect. There is absolutely no friction no issues whatsoever. Uh, since it's the last bearing, I'm going to go ahead and put my finger on the end of it here and see if there's any up and down clearance. And there's not, which is the way it's supposed to be. So we are good to go on that one. I can go ahead and continue on to the next one. If I have one that needs to be addressed, I will go ahead and show you guys how to address that. All right, I'm about to install the very last bearing, the one in the front. Before I do that, I wanted to cover a couple things. Now, I ended up building a custom, just it's welding rod. It's a, a real fine stainless welding rod. I rounded off the edge and I created a hook here. That way I could check every bearing by doing this. And it saved me a lot of time this time. Normally I sit there and I try and use something to fish into the other end or I, you know, normally I'm doing it with the crank out. So it's a lot easier, but even, even so, I think this will actually be handy even with the crank out because I was able to just go in there and very carefully, lightly touch until I find the hole, go like this, and I could see if it's actually going in far enough or if it's not lined up. Luckily, they were all lined up where, where I set them the first try, but I guess that's experience. Um, I wouldn't necessarily expect you to have the same situation. So I got those ones done. Obviously, for this one, I'm not going to need that hook because I can just see it at the end. But I don't install this with the installer tool. Several reasons. For starters, the installer tool is crazy long, so how do I keep this thing actually centered? I don't know where that came from. My knee knocked off. So how do you keep this thing from actually being centered? I don't know. That's hard. That's hard to figure out. It's a very heavy tool considering. I mean, for trying to center it, you're not going to be able to feel your way to making sure it's centered. But when installing this last one, it's much easier to just feel where it's at and start pounding it in. Now, obviously, I'm not going to use a hammer on the end of this, so what I do is I actually have these chunks, these plates of aluminum that I use, and uh, I'll use the plate of aluminum against the bearing and tap it in there. Of course, this one I don't need to mark because I don't need to really be fancy about seeing it. I can literally see right where it's going to line up and make it perfect. So I just line that up, take my piece of aluminum, slide it over top of it, holding against it, and then I'll be able to see if this thing's going on crooked at all as I'm hitting it and I can adjust where I hit to straighten it out. Now, it's all the way in according to this, so I didn't screw anything up, and I will grab the cam tool to finish this off, because now I'll use this to go ahead and make sure it's sitting in deep enough. Everything looks lined up, everything looks good, and now I do the final fitment of the camshaft. Now, this is most likely the last time I am going to be putting the camshaft in here, so I'm going to prepare for the final installation. And so, of course, I'm going to wipe the cam down first to get rid of any of that weird oily stuff that comes from the manufacturer. 
They don't have grinding material on these. At least I've never seen one where it came off with metal dust on it. So I don't believe you're going to have to worry about that. If you see the rag get dark, not just the oil color, then obviously go ahead and degrease the thing. Use some brake clean, what I have you, to get it clean enough. Then you're going to need an engine assembly lube of some sort. Now, being a roller camshaft, it's not like the old school motors where you have to just put gobs and gobs of oil or grease on there. You can just put a light film on there and you'll be perfectly fine. I do start out with a pretty good gob of grease, however, because over lubing does not hurt anything. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to lightly hit a little bit of everything on my way up to the end. Now, you see I only have one glove on. It's because I don't want to waste another glove. I'm cheap like that. But... All I'm going to do here is take this guy, this glove, and use it to spread this stuff all around this thing. And watch out for this little spot here. It'll tear your glove wide open if you're wearing a glove. So just keep that in mind. And then, of course, I'm going to leave this glove on so I can grab a hold of this part of the cam. And I'll be working all the way in there. And then this glove, at the very last moment, I'll finish this last little section where I'm hanging onto it now as far as lubricating it. And then I will be able to take the glove off and discard of it. Now that I got the camshaft installed, I did take the time to turn this a little bit. It is a little bit stiff, but that's okay because I know which one it is. It is the second bearing, and that was the one that was the wider bearing. It was a lot harder to push in. So the metal did deform a little bit, but not enough to where I did the initial check it was able to still turn by hand. It was just a little bit tight. Right now, I could not turn it by hand, and I wouldn't expect, even if that wasn't tight, to be able to. Uh, but if I put a bolt, a couple of bolts in here, I can turn it, but it's a little bit stiff. The thing is, though, that tool, it does leave a couple of marks, and those marks, if they're small like that, where they just have a little bit of resistance to it, the first 15, 20 seconds of this thing fired up and running, that'll clean off and, and polish itself smooth and it won't cause any damage to anything. If, however, you can't turn this thing and you're having to put like a giant wrench on there to be able to turn it, obviously there's going to be a problem. You're going to cause all kinds of issues. So be sure to, to pay very close attention to how tight that is. So when you go to put this thing together, what do you need to do? Obviously you need to get the cam gear on here, but don't forget this cam plate. The cam plate is important. Now, the cam plate itself, before you put it on, you're going to want to take a little grease and put it up on the front here. And this is to lube this face of the cam itself because what will happen is that cam plate actually rides against this face of the cam, the face right here. And so if you leave that dry, it could cause a weird scenario where you have kind of a metal-on-metal -metal binding condition for the first moment of the startup. And it'll create a burr inside there and it'll just chew itself alive. So be sure to put a little bit of lube on that as well before you put the cam plate on. Once the cam plate is on, check that cam plate ahead of time for anything that's an obvious sign of like a blown out. There's a little seal on there and it's right here. And you can see that it's like a silicone seal. If it's completely flush, most of them are, you probably should replace it, but you can get away without replacing it. If you're trying to still run AFM, don't do it. If for any reason you're trying to run AFM, replace this plate. If you're not running AFM and you're maintaining the AFM pump, it's not totally necessary because you have so much volume, a little bit of leakage is not going to hurt anything. It's just going to better lube the chain. So it's not the end of the world. Now, this guy is going non-AFM. He also does not have variable valve timing. I'm not concerned about it. But it does have a very small amount of rays above this plate very small though and like i said this one it's not going to be critical now when you go to torque this thing down some of them have an actual bolt this one has a tapered screw with a torx in it so the tapered screw ones are very very low torque i don't recall the torque off the top of my head but i think it's like 12 foot pounds or something crazy low it feels like you're not torquing it tight enough but do not over torque them if you do it will break this Torque this plate here because this casting is not very strong. It's actually, a, it feels like it's a cast metal. I believe it's a cast metal because 
I did break one once. I thought, that is not enough torque. And this bottom one here is a little bit slotted. It's a little bit oblong. And if you torque this one, even a little bit past what they say to torque to, it will fracture it off of there because of it being a little bit oblong. It doesn't oblong. It doesn't sit in there very well. These two you're not likely to break. This one you could break. This one's extremely likely to break. So like I said, again, I stress that. Do not over torque it. From there, it's basically your normal job. Go ahead and throw your chain on after lining up your marks, things like that. Get your valve train in and you'll be good to go. I'm not going to go ahead and cover that on this video because this video has gone on long enough and it's time for me to sign off. So like, share, subscribe, and as always, I hope to see you in another video. Thanks for watching. I'm going to get this thing put back together and uh, make this customer happy by getting his vehicle or engine ready for his vehicle.